All right, I think we can start, Dr. Glenn. If you're ready, I will start with the introduction. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Liana from WebWork, and it's nice to have you here. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all for joining us and for choosing WebWork. We greatly value your decision to choose our tool for your team, and we are dedicated to creating a thriving community for our users worldwide. Uh, with this webinar, we want to not just offer valuable insights, but also create an opportunity for networking and collaboration among like-minded professionals, like all of you here. Um, it is very important for us at WebWork to do the very best for you, and this webinar is no exception. Today, you will dramatically improve your ability to use hybrid work as an instrument to improve attention and productivity while cutting costs. And it is my pleasure to introduce uh, your speaker, Dr. Gleb Tsipersky, who was lauded as Office Whisper and Hybrid Expert by the New York Times for helping leaders use hybrid work to improve retention and productivity. Um, he serves as the CEO of the Future of Work Consulting from Disaster Avoidance Experts. Um, Dr. Gleb wrote seven best-selling books and published over 650 articles in prominent venues such as Harvard Business Review, Forbes, and Fortune. His expertise comes from over 20 years of consulting and training, and his clients include Fortune 500 companies, from Affleck to Xerox. His expertise also comes from his academic background as a behavioral scientist. Dr. Gleb taught for eight years as a lecturer at UNC Chapel Hill and seven years as a professor at Ohio State. And he is a proud Ukrainian American and lives in Columbus, Ohio. In his free time, he spends about quality time with his wife to avoid his personal life from turning into a disaster because um, he's a disaster avoidance expert and to help you take advantage of his groundbreaking expertise, we have asked him to share with us about using hybrid work to improve retention and productivity while cutting costs. And now please give a big round of virtual applause to welcome Dr. Glatt. Thank you so much, Feliana. I appreciate your kind introduction. Welcome everyone. So let's talk about how you can use hybrid work to improve retention and productivity while cutting costs. So here's the shape of the presentation that you can expect. First, we'll be talking about how we think about hybrid work. So the framing of the question, the framing of the issue. Then we'll talk a little bit about the research, what the research shows us. Next, we'll talk about some of the mistakes that leaders tend to make. And finally, we'll end with some best practices for hybrid work. So without further ado, let's talk about hybrid work and how we can think about it effectively to improve retention and productivity while at the same time cutting costs. Now, what will be the first thing I'll want to share with you is not necessarily so much about hybrid work itself, but how we think about issues in general. So think, imagine that here you'll go after this presentation, you'll go to your refrigerator, you'll open up the freezer and you'll see a choice of two flavors of ice cream. One that contains 10% fat and another one that's 90% fat Free. So 10% fat or 90% fat free. You should be able to see my slides right next to me. If you don't, make sure to click on view and select speaker and make it full screen. So think about those two flavors of ice cream, 10% fat or 90% fat free. Which of those ice cream flavors is going to be more appealing to you? Now that you thought about it, let's have a vote. So you could should see the Zoom poll. And please go ahead and vote on the Zoom poll whether you would prefer ice cream that's 90% fat free or 10% fat. Please go ahead and vote. Five more seconds. Make your voice heard. Okay, so we see that some people would like the 10% fat, some people would like the 90% fat free, right? That's pretty clear. And more people would like the 10% fat. But if we think about it, 10% fat means the same thing as 90% fat free, right? 90% fat free means it's 10% fat. 
But generally speaking, we have clear feelings about one or the other. So what's going on here? Well, what's going on is called the framing effect. How information is framed for us, how it's presented to us, really influences how we think about it and what decisions we make. So I want to use as an example to think about and for you to consider what's your framing around hybrid work? How do you think about hybrid work? How does your organization think about hybrid work? How do your teams, your leaders think about hybrid work? What is the framing around hybrid work in your organization? Too often I see leaders see perceiving hybrid work as a loss. There was a survey conducted by KPMG, the global accounting giant organization that showed that by 2026, 63% of all leaders of large companies, of companies that are in Fortune 500 and so on, would like their staff to go back to the office full time, 63%. Why is that? Well, because they see hybrid work as a loss, as a problem. They don't see it as what it is. It's a disruption and therefore an opportunity. An opportunity that helps you, if you approach it wisely, improve productivity and retention while cutting costs. And that's what allows smart and savvy leaders, hopefully folks like you, to seize competitive advantage in this environment. And here, what I want to encourage you to do is not put your personal comfort ahead of the bottom line. It can be very comfortable to go with what we assume works well for us, our habits and preferences, but we really need to put that aside and focus on business objectives and outcomes rather than what feels personally comfortable for us. We need to overcome decision-making errors we all tend to make around hybrid work and integrate best practices on innovative work arrangements. So that's really important for us to understand when we're making decisions. Now, when we're thinking about this, like think how many days in the office would you like to be? So think about this question. How many days in the office would you like to be? What is your preferred working style? And now that you thought about it, let's answer the poll question. Which of these is your preferred working style? Ranging from fully remote to full time, five days in the office and everything in between. Please go ahead and vote. Five more seconds, share the last of your thoughts. Okay, so here we see just under 20%, one fifth would prefer to be fully remote. The plurality, would, the majority would like to be three days a week in the office and then four days a week in the office, but nobody would like to be a full-time schedule five days a week in the office. Good, let's see how that aligns with the broader research. Of course, we have a very small sample size here and it's self-selected for people who want to come to a presentation on hybrid work. So no wonder that hybrid work is ahead. So let's look at major surveys, independent surveys of people who are remote capable. So remote capable workers, what do the surveys say? And these, by the way, are surveys of, done by organizations like the Harvard Business School, like Gallup, like the Society for Human Resource Management, which don't have any particular stake in the outcome. And so these are credible surveys that show that 75 to 85% of workers don't want traditional office-centric work. So something like 15 to 25% of remote capable workers want to work in the office full-time. And we see that that's not the case for anyone here. Something like 25 to 35% want full-time remote work. And we see here is the people present in this call, that's a little bit lower percentage, probably because this is a talk on hybrid work. 40 to 55% would leave their job if forced to come in full-time. And so thinking about those numbers in the middle that 15 to 25% want traditional office-centric work, 25 to 35% want full-time remote work, something like 60%, 55, 60% want some kind of hybrid modality. And of course, we see that here in this presentation, something like four-fifths, so over 80% would like a hybrid modality. Over 70% are less likely to leave if offered substantial remote work. So a couple of days of 
remote work per week. Remote employees we see are more productive. So remote employees, when they're in a hybrid modality, when they're working remotely. Over 55% report higher productivity, 15% report lower, 30% report the same. It's not simply employee self-reports. Employee monitoring software shows the same thing, that staff when working remotely are 5% more productive. And the Stanford University study showed that in by May 2020, remote workers, when people are working remotely, compared to when they're working in the office of so hybrid workers, but remote, they are 5% more productive when working remotely. And that's a couple of months after everything closed down due to the pandemic. By May 2022, so two months into the pandemic, they were 9% more productive, 9% more productive. So why did people working remotely become more productive? Well, there's a clear reason why they were more productive in the first place, because they didn't have to do the commute. And we know that people devote about 40% of the time that they would have spent commuting to their primary work tasks. And that's one. Second, we know that people are working at a time that's much more aligned with their energy levels. And that's another big benefit. That's some people are morning doves, some people are night owls. And if they can work at a time more aligned with their energy levels, they're going to be more productive. And finally, they're less distracted. So they're less distracted, they can focus more on their tasks. And that was true for the 5% more productivity in May 2020. By May 2022, people learned how to work together more effectively. So they learned how to work together in teams more effectively. Companies invested into remote work technology, whether it's tools like WebWork, whether it's tools like Trello, whether it's tools like Slack or Microsoft Teams. All of these tools enabled more effective work when people were working remotely. And so that is important to understand. And also employees invested into, and companies invested into the home offices of their staff members, buying better technology, more comfortable surroundings. So that also improved things. And we know that remote and hybrid employees have better well-being. So over 75% feel less stressed if they have substantial remote work, something like half the work week, couple of days. Over 70% have better well-being and over 75% report feeling happy. So pretty clearly, spending time working remotely in a hybrid modality, so a couple of days a week, two, three days, four days maybe, depending on the person, definitely improves well-being, facilitates productivity, and improves retention as well as recruitment. There's a lot of benefits, in other words, to, to having hybrid work. So we talked about improving hybrid work, improving retention and productivity. And it also cuts costs because, of course, having poor retention is going to cost you a lot. Having poor productivity is going to cost you a lot. And having employees burned out and having more sick days is going to cost you a lot. So that's the data. But leaders often make mistakes around hybrid work. And the mis specific mistakes that I've seen most often relate to a series of judgment errors called cognitive biases. Cognitive biases are the mistakes we make because of how our brain is wired. And one of the biggest dangerous judgment errors is called the status quo bias. Now, the cognitive biases come from our evolutionary heritage, our background. We're not evolved for the modern environment. We're evolved for the ancestral savanna. When we lived in small tribes of 15 people to 150 people, when we're hunter-gatherers, we had to survive based on the fight-or-flight reflex. And we had a very precarious survival situation. So our survival was very much dependent on the situation not changing. The only thing that really changed was the changing of the seasons, the summer, spring, fall, winter, all of those sorts of things changed, the seasons changed, but if the situation changed, that was dangerous, that was bad. So we had a drive to go back to the previous status quo. So that's a desire to maintain or get back to the status quo, even when the new status quo might be much better in terms of objective reality. And there's a downplaying of major disruption from the pandemic, downplaying of the fact that people have much more of a desire for flexibility, that downplaying that the pandemic occurred at all and that it actually had an impact on people's perspectives and perceptions. In the modern world, we have many more disruptors, whether it's things like generative AI, like remote work, like the pandemic, like the rise of smartphones, the rise of the internet. I've lived through that, maybe that ages me. 
So that is something that really changes our environment. And leaders are very often not well adapted to the situation. They've been successful for 20, 30, 40 years in the office, and they're really uncomfortable with getting outside of that environment. Another cognitive bias is the empathy gap. So you remember that ancestral environment where we had to be very much tribal. We had to care about the feelings of people who are in our tribe, and we had to be actively hostile to those who are not part of our tribe. So the empathy gap has to do with us not caring nearly enough about the feelings of people who we perceive to be in other tribes, other people's emotions, and their role in shaping their decision-making. For example, we have extensive research showing that people have more desire for flexibility and well-being after the pandemic. A recent study by the Federal Bank of St. Louis found that people are actually working less, fewer hours. We have a still a high proportion of people working, but especially educated men are working less hours. So college-educated men are actually spending less hours working because of that desire for more flexibility and well-being. And that's very hard for business leaders to understand who really like their work and who don't have as much of a desire for flexibility and well-being. But if you don't empathize and understand these people's desires, then it's going to be very hard for you to have good retention and good engagement and good morale. And the final error that I want to talk about is functional fixedness. Functional fixedness. It's kind of like the hammer nail syndrome. When you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, when you learn to lead in one setting, to function in one setting, you tend to apply that to all other settings. And even in contexts where that doesn't work very well. And so that's the hammer nail syndrome. We perceive only one right way of function, leading, managing teams. So there was, were many leaders who transposed office culture on hybrid and remote work in May 2020, and they failed to adapt strategically to this new reality. They didn't change what they were doing to adapt to this new reality. So this is a serious issue, and that's something that we need to be aware of and worried about. And of these cognitive biases, which of these might be most problematic for the future of work in your workplace? Please go ahead and vote. Give you five more seconds if you haven't voted yet. Which of the biases are most problematic? Okay, so we see the empathy gap is the leader by the majority think it's the biggest problem. The third thinks it's the status quo bias and then just under a fifth for functional fixedness. This is a good opportunity for you to think about these biases and take back the ones that you think are most important to your team and encourage them to address these problems. All right. And so how do we avoid undercutting the ability to compete in the future of work through these cognitive biases, through these decision-making errors? Well, we need to take advantage of best practices. Oh, you're welcome, Liana. I'm glad this was helpful. That's what Liana said in the chat. So best practices for competitive advantage in the future of work is a team-led model. So hybrid model with a team-led approach. What does that mean? There are a number of things that you want to think about hybrid. So hybrid is a complex dynamic of working. It's not full-time in the office. It's not full-time remote. That means that there are many options that you can choose. There are a number of companies that choose full flexibility where anyone can go to the office if they want at any time. There are a number of companies that choose a structured model. Everyone comes in four days a week or something like that. Uh, and then there's a number of models that are in the middle. And the most effective model we now know is a team-led model. That means that you don't just set the same policy for the company for everyone to do the same thing in terms of coming in these three days a week. You don't set the same pile. You don't just let everyone do whatever they want, but you have teams coordinate together on whatever they need. So you devolve, you push down decision-making authority. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. If you are, let's say, a programmer, a lot of programmers 
do a lot of spend a lot of their time working on their programming tasks. Now, why do you need to be in the office to work on your programming tasks? It's going to be distracting for you to, to do so. It's not a very good approach. So lots of people, programmers, instead, what they prefer to do is they gather together in the beginning of a programming sprint to plan things out, do some brainstorming, figure things out with their team members, and then come together at the end of a sprint to review how things went and work on whatever else they need to work on. If you're going to be an accountant, then it's generally going to be better for you to come to the office at the end of a month for several days to close the books and maybe work individually during the rest of the time, maybe coming in once a week for team building for the rest of the month. If you're going to be a salesperson, salespeople, a lot of them, I've seen them work well when they come into the office and they're energized by each other if they need to make outbound calls, for example. So they may want to come to the office three or four days a week if they have that team spirit and that's important for them. So it really depends on what you do, what role you're in, what your team does. Also, if you're junior, you might benefit from coming to the office more frequently to learn from others compared to someone who's more senior and who already has an established network and knows what they're doing very well. And so you want to think about what kind of a role you have in terms of your job, the seniority of those people, and that's why it's best to let teams make their own decisions. We see very clearly that the highest engagement, so there's Gallup research shows that the highest engagement comes when teams make their own decision on how and when to come into the office. And you, as a result, you get a hybrid first modality. So the large majority of people want to come to the office. So that's the hybrid first model. And a minority want to work full time remotely. So hybrid employees generally come to the office one to two days a week. That's the majority. Fully remote employees are going to be a minority, 10 to 30%. These are going to be more of your individual contributors or another sort of people who I see working well remotely is if you're a distributed team and you don't have people locally who are part of your team. There's no point in coming to the office if you're not really going to be working with your team there. And you want to adopt best practices for hybrid and remote work arrangements. You also want to make sure that these people get training on effective hybrid work, what to do at home and what to focus on in the office. Now, we very clearly see that focusing at home versus in the office. At home, you want to work on your individual tasks. This might involve things like writing reports, doing spreadsheet work, doing programming, analysis of various sorts. That's kind of one, your head down tasks. Another activity that's best done at home is working on your emails and other asynchronous communication, which on average takes employees 30% of their time, asynchronous communication. There's no reason to come to the office and work any sit in your email all day. And finally, video conference calls. There's no point in coming to the office and distracting everyone with your video conference call and being distracted by them. Now, the office is a really important location for collaborative tasks. So meeting with your team members and discussing decision-making questions or figuring out strategy, shaping people's perspectives and opinions, looking at their reactions. It's very important to be in person for those intense conversations where you want to see people, the full range of people's body language, their tone of voice. Right now, you only see me as a small square on a Zoom screen. You can hear my tone of voice, but it's not as clear as it would be in person. And also, you only see my facial body gestures. You only see my face, you don't see the rest of my body. So it's not nearly as clear as what I would be communicating. If I was in person, my communication would be clearer, more intense, more engaged. You will also build up more trust. There's more of a sense of connection when you're in person. And so you want to do on more intense team activities in person, team discussions, activities in person. One-on-one -on -one discussions that, have, that are also more nuanced, like about performance evaluation or conflict resolution. Then a third thing that's better done in the office is team building and socializing. And finally, mentoring and on the job training, especially in the early stages of both when you're building relationships, learning about things are better done in the office. So you want to train people on how to structure schedules and how to manage their time and office activities so that you minimize commuting time. 
because that's the thing that people hate the most, commuting. So if you could minimize people's commuting time, that'll be very great. And you want to train people on effective virtual communication and collaboration. Communication and collaboration are definitely more challenging to do when you're virtual, when you're remote. So in a hybrid modality, the amount of time that people spend virtually, it can be quite difficult to coordinate effectively and communicate and collaborate effectively. So you, you really need to train people on these things and you need to have the right policies and approaches and techniques to it. One really good technique for collaboration and team bonding is to replace in-person co-working with virtual co-working. Now, there's a lot of benefits to in-person co-working when you're sitting next to each other, you're chatting about various tasks, you can ask people questions, but there's a way to emulate that benefit in a virtual setting. So what you want to do is work alongside your team members on a video conference call. You, It's for fully virtual teams or for hybrid teams on the days that they're not coming to the office. You sign into a one hour video conference call. And what you do is you start, everyone starts. So this is for a team of the typical team, four to eight people. Start by sharing the project on which you'll work during this period. This is going to be your individual tasks, just like you're co-working with workers in the office, but you're not having a meeting, but that's not the point. This is just co-working so activities, so working next to them. You're working on your individual tasks. So take 10 seconds to share what tasks you'll work on. Then you turn off your microphones, you leave your speakers on, and your video is going to be optional. Next, when you have questions or innovation ideas or problems to solve, you turn on your microphone and share these. And then other people will turn on their microphones and they'll share their ideas. They can answer questions, discuss this. There'll be a few minutes discussion after that happens. And then everyone turns off their microphones and you go on to do your work. And there might be three, four episodes of this during a one hour call. You end by all turning on your microphones and sharing what you accomplished. This is really helpful for team bonding, facilitating innovation, and especially for junior team members. So you think of junior team members, they have a lot of trouble integrating into the team. So this approach is going to be really helpful for integrating them and helping them have a good experience working inside a team. Now, thinking about this approach, how valuable would it be for you and your team members to integrate this technique into your workplace? Please go ahead, vote if you haven't yet. Good. See, most people voted. Five more seconds for those who are still deciding about virtual co working. Okay, great. We see it's quite popular. Everyone would find it valuable. And about half of you would find it highly valuable and half would find it moderately valuable. That's excellent, especially if you find highly valuable. It's a great opportunity for you to take this technique and apply it to your teams. All right. Let's talk about solving another series of problems with burnout and proximity bias through excellence from anywhere. Now, you've probably heard the term proximity bias. It combines concerns by people who are hybrid or remote about career advancement when other people spend time in the office. So if someone spends more time in the office than you do, you might be worried that your boss will favor that person. And there's envy by people who spend more time in the office for people who have more flexibility or hybrid remote people. So to address that, you really need to focus on developing a culture of excellence from anywhere, which focuses on outputs, on deliverables, not inputs, not where you work. That is what helps address envy because it's not about location, it's about outcomes. It helps address burnout because it focuses on what you do, not where you do it. And it helps provide performance management with a focus on frequent small scale performance evaluations with weekly, biweekly, or monthly goals. Let's talk a little bit about that. This is a huge challenge. The managers, there was Microsoft conducted a survey that showed that of 87% of managers have difficulty with my, Microsoft calls productivity paranoia, meaning that they have difficulty trusting that their workers are productive when they're spending time away from the office. And to address that, you need to have small-scale frequent performance evaluations. 
at weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly one-on-one. So once a week, once every two weeks, or once a month. It depends on your seniority level. So junior people, definitely better to do once a week when you're more moderately established, maybe twice a month, once every two weeks. And really senior people and managers, once a month is good. Also depends on how closely collaborate and how much individual of, of an individual contributor you are. It helps team members always know where they stand and give psychological safety, which is really good for their retention and career growth. And it also helps prevent hybrid and remote workers from overworking and burning out due to anxiety. So what does this involve? So a team member and a supervisor agree to weekly goals, or again, every two weeks or a month, at a weekly one-on-one. -on -one. So many managers already have weekly or bi-weekly or monthly one-on-ones with their team members. This just adds a performance management element to it. Very helpful to have that performance management element. And what you do is you tie the your team's broader, so managers generally have KPIs, key performance indicators, or OKRs, objectives and key results for their team, but they don't have them for each individual team member, and especially not on a small scale level. They might have them for each individual team member for that one annual performance evaluation. But what you need to do is tie these KPIs slash OKRs to these small frequent evaluations, performance evaluations to have those goals. And you set those goals for each one week, two week, one monthly period, 24 hours before the next one-on-one. -on -one. The team member sends their supervisor report on goals they accomplished, problems they solved, a self and a self-evaluation. At the one-on-one, -on -one, the manager evaluates their performance, coaches them on any problem solving that they did that they could do better, affirms or revises their evaluation and sets goals for the next week. So this is a very helpful approach for teams to be able to be much more productive and to be much more coordinated on what they're actually doing and to feel much better about their supervisor and their supervisor's role in their activities. So this is a really cool technique that uh, people get a lot of benefit from. Now, thinking about this approach, how much value do you think this approach would have for you? So think about this approach. And please vote on how valuable would it be for you. So this culture of excellence from any work with weekly performance evaluations. Please go ahead and vote. All right, I see most people voted. Let's have five more seconds. Make your voice heard. Great, we see that this is even more popular than the previous one. So it's just under two thirds would find it highly valuable and over a third would find it moderately valuable. That's excellent. That's a great chance for you to take this and share it with your team. Cool. Now, what is the actual impact of these techniques? Let me share with you the experience of someone who adopted this team-led methodology with virtual co-working, with the hybrid leadership that I taught, with the excellence from anywhere, frequent small-scale performance evaluations. This is going to be Craig Knobloch, who is the executive director of the Information Sciences Institute at the University of Southern California. This is about a 300-ish research institute in artificial intelligence and cybersecurity, so very hot topics. And he's going to share about his adoption of these techniques. Let's see what he has to say. Uh, Gleb Zabersky, to my attention sometime back during the pandemic, when uh, I was planning to have our research institute uh, follow the standard path that all the big corporations are following. So Apple and Google were announcing plans to have people come back three days a week. So I thought that seems like a good plan. So we actually sent out a message said, 
okay, starting this date, everyone's coming back three days a week, uh, and then you know can work from home two days a week. Uh, and and then I saw a video that Gleb actually a video talk that Gleb actually gave for IEEE uh, that really actually changed my mind about this. And it was a video about hybrid work and how important it was to actually embrace it. And uh, uh, and one of the things I was impressed in the video is that all these interesting ideas about how to make hybrid work more effective and stuff. So I signed up for a meeting with Gleb and uh, uh, learned quite a bit more about you know, how to do hybrid work well. And so Gleb has come on as a consultant for the Information Science Institute and has been really helpful in terms of putting us much more in a leadership position in terms of figuring out how to do hybrid work. So we changed our policies. We are much more flexible about who can work at home and, and allowing people to work from home, you know, whatever makes sense with respect to their supervisor, uh, creating spaces in people's home offices, uh, figuring out how to onboard people in a way that, you know, when people haven't met in person, that is more effective. Uh, so I think he's been incredibly helpful in terms of really transitioning us to be a, sort of a lead in, in how we manage hybrid work at the, at the Institute. So it's been incredibly useful with all of Club's advice and I appreciate all the help he's given us with respect to moving forward with this, our hybrid work plans. Okay. Good, so hopefully that was helpful for you to get Craig's perspective on this approach. Now, when you're thinking about this broader approach of a team-led model, so this broad approach, how valuable do you think it would be for you and your team members to integrate this team-led approach when encompassing everything that we've talked about? Please go ahead and vote. Five more seconds, share your thoughts. Okay, great. So we see that this would be, again, highly valuable for just under two thirds. That's excellent and moderately valuable for over a third and everyone finds valuable. So great. So take the components that you find highly valuable, especially and adapt to your teams. Excellent. Great. So let's finish up and talk about what are our key takeaways from this key inflection on the future of work. You want to integrate addressing decision-making cognitive biases into your culture to optimize business outcomes, despite personal discomfort. Use a team-led hybrid first model with a minority fully remote to retain the best talent, improve productivity, maximize well-being, and address burnout. Adapt your culture to hybrid and remote work. You want to train people on effective hybrid work and virtual communication and collaboration. Integrate virtual co-working to facilitate collaboration for your team members, team building, integrating junior staff, and address proximity bias, burnout, and performance management through excellence from anywhere and weekly performance evaluations. Now it's up to you. Go out and make it happen, and I'll send you free additional resources. So a copy of my best-selling book, Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams, and a free coaching session for the first three claimants. Now, if you register for the webinar, I'll send it to you automatically. If you're watching this as a recording, you haven't registered for it, it's just a recording afterward, go to tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event to get these resources. So again, you should be able to see that under my name, tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event. Again, tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event. All right, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Let's see. Um, I see a question in the chat that we, I think we can turn to it. Um, it is mm -hmm. from Har. She asks, can starter companies afford to implement a hybrid model or when is the right time to do so? So starter companies, I generally recommend starting remotely. And we've seen that remote comp that uh, the younger company is, the more likely they are to start remotely. Now, when you want to adopt a hybrid model moving from a remote model is when you see that there's going to be, if you decide, you want to decide from the beginning if you're going to be fully remote 
and then you'll just be hiring people from all over the world and you'll never be hired. If you don't want to be fully remote and you want people, you want, you'll want to hire people from a certain location who can get to a certain location once you have enough money to rent an office. I don't recommend just renting an office. I recommend having just using techniques like having flex space, co-working space, and renting that on an as-needed basis for collaborative activities. And having a budget for teams to come together in their spaces. So having a flexible approach with teams being able to gather when they need to in a co-working space. So again, starting fully remote, because if you're starting up, you don't have that much money, and that's a good approach to starting up. You'll see if it works, and as you have more money, using flex spaces is the best approach. Once you become established, well enough established, you have more than 50 people, you can consider renting your own office if that's going to be important to you to have your location and so on. But many companies I work with have helped 26 companies figure out their hybrid and remote work plans, including early stage companies. And many of them chose just to continue as they became established and bigger, just to continue renting office space for whenever they needed it for various events or having teams having their own line budgets to rent office space for team events. So that seems like the best approach to me. So Gohar asks about policies or guidelines for productivity and collaboration. So I think I talked about virtual co-working and productivity. That's oh, my book will talk about in much more detail, specifically how to have policies and guidelines. But the best collaboration technique is going to be that virtual co-working. So helping you do that. And the best for productivity is going to be that performance management, that weekly, bi-weekly performance management approach. Thank you. I think mm -hmm. she got there. Do you have any other questions? You can unmute yourself or you can put questions into the chat. Happy to answer either way. Okay, I don't think there are any more questions. Do you want to close us out? Yes, um, if you think so, um, we will finish here, shall we? Excellent. Much All right. for your full and interesting webinar. I hope our users um, got what, what, what why they came here for. And I want to remind everyone that you will get Dr. Gleb's book to your emails. Um, thank you very much for joining. Thank you. You're welcome all.